today we're talking about FERPTA, which is a tax that the IRS assesses on foreign sellers. If you're not a resident of the United States for tax reasons, you could have an exit tax at the time of selling your property. Today we're going to interview an estate attorney to give us the real facts, no BS, about FERPTA and how this could apply to you. Stay tuned. Welcome to Loan with Jeff episode today, we are talking about FERPTA. So for those of you that don't know what FERPTA is, if you are a foreign person that you're not a citizen and you're not a permanent resident alien, if you're here as a non-perm or you're a visitor on a visitor visa and you purchase a property in the U.S., you need to listen to this episode. So we have a special guest today, John Strohmeyer, and he is an attorney and he stumbled upon FERPTA from time to time. So he's going to talk to us today. John, welcome. Uh, Jen, thanks so much for having me back. Yeah, uh, FERPTA is is an initialism for the Foreign Investors in Real Property Tax Act. So here in Houston, also throughout Texas, we have a lot of foreign investors who are buying real property. And so that means we need to be thinking about what FERPTA is going to require for them. So defining a foreign person, um, it's anybody who's here that's not a re- not a permanent resident, they don't have a green card, and they're not a U.S. citizen. So that would mean people that are here on a work visa. Uh, so that those are two of the tests. One of them, if you are a citizen of the United States, doesn't matter where you live, you are still domestic for the uh, purposes of the income tax. And so what we're talking about, FERPTA is an income tax issue. So we look at the definition of who is a resident for income tax purposes. One, if you're a citizen. Two, if you have a green card and you have set foot in the U.S., then you're subject to the normal rules of U.S. income taxation. Finally, if you spend enough time in the U.S., it's called the substantial presence test. What they do is they count up the number of days you're spending in the U.S. in two different ways. And if you tick off both marks, then yes, you're a citizen or then you're a resident for income tax purposes. Test one, are you here for 30 days or more in the current year? And then over the current tax year that we care about and the two previous tax years, we count up all your days. And if it adds up to 183 or more, then congratulations, you're a U.S tax resident. It gets a little more complicated than that. It's 100% of the days in the year we count up, care about, a, a third of the days in the immediately prior year, and one-sixth of the days in the year two years ago. It all adds up. If you spend 120 days a year, you're never going to hit that 183-day test. But that's a kind of a different thing. We're talking about people who are here and have to file 1040s every year. Those are the folks that are going to be exempt from FERPTA. So if you're not filing a 1040 as a resident, then you are you need to be worried about FERPTA. Okay. So for my, I have lots of clients that work for, you know, companies and they're on a L1 or they're on a, on a work visa since they're here all the time. I mean, they're here working with their families and everything. Then that's a possible exception to the FERPTA that we're going to talk about, right? Right. Because if they're being treated as a resident, you know, as a resident for income tax purposes, then we have less, like we're not worried about this. So if they're treated in tax as a resident, you know, they're here for a few years and treated as an income tax resident, then yes, they're they're going to be, they can forget about most of what we're going to talk about. The problem though will crop up when they move out. And if they buy a house and sell the house after they've left, it will be an issue. Oh, so if they go back to their country and maybe keep it as a rental, it would possibly come up. Right, it's possibly going to come up there for income income tax purposes. And um, I guess, so I guess it, it's probably good to say, well, what does FERPTA do and what does it actually mean? That was my next question. Well, good. Uh, it's a good question. It does two things. First is it subjects that real property to taxation here in the U.S. as though the person were doing business in the U.S. And this, what it's, what it really says is you buy and sell, you get to apply deductions, you're taxed at graduated rates. The alternative rule is either, well, there was no tax because it's a capital gains transaction, which you know, Congress didn't like that. The, there was a problem years ago with too many people from outside the U.S. buying up real estate inside the U.S. And because they didn't have to worry about income tax, they could buy and sell at an advantage uh, that we, you know, citizens, residents, the folks actually living here didn't have. So Congress was basically evening the playing field. And also, well, look, if they can raise some money off this, why not? So thing number one, they're subjecting these sales of real property inside the U.S. by not 
non-resident taxpayers to income tax here in the U.S. Again, once you get past that first hurdle, you still have the normal rules apply. This should, you know, if it's a house, it's probably going to be a capital gain transaction. If you have any costs or deductions, you get to apply that. And then the rates are graduated as appropriate for your situation. So hang on, let's just stop right there, if you don't mind, just to make sure. it text. So let's say I that FERPTA applies to me. Let's say I'm a foreign, I live in a different country, live and work, but I bought a place here either as a second home investment, it doesn't matter. And right. I go to sell it. Am I only going to be taxed on the capital gain or am I taxed on the whole thing? So you're getting at something that there are two parts to this, because what you may be thinking about, there's the, the tax on the sale that would be due. And then there's the mandatory withholding, which you might be thinking about. And so this is where you have to know what's going on. And once you've got that, you know, let's assume you buy a house for $900,000 and you sell it for a million dollars. And we're, we're not going to worry about the tax rates. What first thing we have that FERPTA is going to say, all right, you bought for 900 and you sold for a thousand, you have a $100,000 gain on that transaction. And you would run that through the tax rates. You know, if it's a 20% capital gain rate, then 20% of that $100,000 gain, that is the tax that you owe on that transaction. And that's whether, you know, citizen, green card, resident, non-resident, that's the basic tax rule. For the first part of FERPTA is all it does is say foreign, non-resident, alien individuals, y'all have to pay tax on these transactions. The second part is the mandatory withholding. And this may also have been what you were thinking about, which, you know, 100,000 or a a million dollar sale, there's a mandatory withholding of 15% on all transactions where the seller, not the buyer, the seller is a foreign person. What they're doing, Congress is making sure that their tax money gets into the IRS first, and then they can come back and file their tax return and get a refund. So there's an exception for million dollar homes where you could get a reduced withholding rate of 10%. We're going to put that aside for just right now. The normal withholding rate is 15%. So on that million dollar sale, even though we talked about 20% tax on the $100,000 gain, so uh, $20,000 tax, the buyer, the person forking over that million dollars is going to, when they go to close, $150,000 of that is going to the IRS. It's not going to the seller. It's not going going anywhere else. It's not, you know, the, the lender may cut the check to the title company and the title company sends it in, you know, kind of depending on who the title company is and how they work things. But $150,000 being 15% of that million dollar purchase, it's going right to the IRS. When the foreign seller, you mentioned buyer, but when the foreign seller is selling, the title company is responsible for withholding the 15% and they have to send it somewhere, right? Right, right. So, but what about the capital? Capital gain part. I mean, if I'm a foreign person and I don't file a U.S. tax return, how am I settling up on that? Well, that's the thing. It's the the 15 percent withholding is meant basically as the down payment on that tax. And so as the as a foreign person, they're going to have to file a tax return to claim their, you know, claim their deductions and get a refund if applicable. So for you know, for you and your million dollar sale, you know, you've got twenty thousand dollars of tax. But if you sell that, if you sell that house in January of 2023, you're not going to file a 2023 tax return until January yeah. of 2024 and then you know, ask for your refund back. So it'll be a year that you're waiting for that money. So bottom line, and the reason I wanted to do this this podcast, and thank you so much again uh, for giving us all this great information, is that if you're a foreign person that's not living full-time in the U.S., you need to be aware that you very likely at closing, whether you owe it or not, because you might have some kind of an exception. I, I read on the IRS website, I saw there's a bunch of exceptions. I'll put some links in the in the notes of some people to read up more. But regardless of whether you think you are eligible for an exception or not, you have to have the 15% withheld. And it's as you, that's a good way to put it. It's a deposit. And then it's the burden to file the tax return and reconcile, get a refund or whatever, or pay more tax if you owe it on the gain is it's, it's under, it's on your plate to get that done. Right. Your meaning. Okay. Right. Got you. One last question. Cause when I was reading up on this, the buyers are involved a little bit. Like, let's say I'm, I'm just a U.S. person and I happen to buy a house that is owned by 
by this foreign person that is selling. They will say they don't live in the U.S. This was an investment property, whatever the reason. There was some language that said that the buyer has to sign something and the buyer is responsible for something. Like, how is this fair? Like, what is all that? So what they're trying to do is a, you know, that when the money leaves the U.S. shores, this is always a warning. You know, be careful if you don't know what you're doing. And yeah, the, the buyer, if they're the last person holding that million dollars before it gets wired off to wherever else, the buyer is responsible for sending in that $15,000 pay or the $150,000 payment on the million dollars. Like the buyer is responsible for that. The IRS can come after them for that that amount of money. Uh, they can be on the hook for all of that. So it's very company. important. Yeah, what? The title company side, right? Well, um, the title company would be the last one in line. So, it, you know, the, the title company is going to make sure, uh, should be making sure that the actual buyer gets everything signed up and they have all their disclosures signed. But if you were just talking about, you know, two humans without a title company, you know, Jen, you're, you're the foreign investor and I'm the domestic buyer. And we just had a sale between the two of us with no title company involved. No. I as the domestic yeah. buyer would be in trouble for not sending that that 15% payment in. You know, I'll have to I'm going to talk to some of my investor friends cuz you know investors take ha- properties off hands of foreign people all the time and I always wonder that's a more complex question that I'm going to ask them, like, do you guys even know, has this ever happened to you and what their responsibility is? It's likely that they might not, they might not understand. Yeah, I mean, it's right. Because, you know, again, there's no mandate. Well, there is required reporting. The problem is, you know, if people are going to get around this, the, you know, it's a great way to skirt tax that may otherwise be due. And so that's why it's been set up. Part of the reason it's been set up this way. So if I'm an investor and I, let's say I acquire somehow a property of a person that's foreign. I mean, is it chances the IRS may never even find out about it? Because like, let's say I did it through some, you know, there's some funky back channels that investors use with hard money and all these other right. things. I mean, I guess it's like, unless they get caught, right? Like how I mean, the IRS- you know, it, you take your chances and, you know, as a lawyer, I can't say, hey, you know, roll the dice on this. It, that's not no, a good I'm plan. Sure. I'm just kind of thinking, I'm brainstorming and thinking this through while I'm on the, on the, on the video with you. It's just very interesting and complex. Right. You know? So, um, but there, we're what we're seeing on the mortgage end is I'm seeing a lot of foreign citizens, especially you know my husband's from Mexico, so there's a lot of Mexican people that they're like, hey, I I want to put my money in and buy a property in the U.S. Like I, yep, I mean, yep. yeah, interesting, 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 and it's residential, commercial, any of it, it doesn't matter, any of it. That's super interesting. Well, thank. I'm gonna put John's uh, contact info. I mean, do you you help people with this, right? Like you help. We can't. Yeah, just uh, some of the stuff we can do, and it it's uh, we'll take a look at it and see how things get handled. A lot of this comes up less from an income tax perspective, but it leads into well, what happens if foreign persons die owning real estate here in the U.S. Because your specialty, yeah, your specialty is estate and probate. Right, because the 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 estate tax is much more punishing for non-residents because they have an exemption instead of the twelve point nine two million per person, it's only sixty thousand dollars. So having a two hundred thousand dollar townhouse here in Houston means that you're on the hook for you know what's that sixteen hundred uh, about sixty thousand dollars in estate tax. Yeah, so buying a house and passing away while you're here owning that house is not such a good combo. Right. Because then you say, oh, well, I'll just get rid of it. And then that's when we start triggering FERPTA problems. Mm -hmm. So that's how you run into it. Well, I'll put your contact information um, in the, in the, in the notes. And thank you so much for giving us some education. I learned several things today and have some more questions that'll maybe spark another episode. But thanks for joining us, John. Thanks for tuning in and listening in, guys and uh, guys and gals. And we'll talk soon. Great. Thanks so much, Jen.